Well, hello there. Good evening, and welcome to Peninsula number 28, Peninsula Greets. I'm your host, Mahmoud Hashemi, and I'll be hosting our third virtual Peninsula here, uh, along with our first Peninsula of 2021. New year, new hobbies, got the violin. If you stick around, you might get a taste. And new friends waiting for you in the Discord chat. Link in the description below. We've got three great talks for you tonight and one lightning talk. That's also great. First up, we've got Marielle Wijaya. She's going to be telling us about the mysterious Sphinx documentation engine. So hopefully you've got your restructured text reference handy. I'm sure she'll fill you in. Then we've got a lightning talk COVID vaccination update from returning champion Maya Ayubi. And finally, we'll have two talks from Mark Rice and Moshe Zadka about fast API and unit testing patterns, respectively. So, hopefully you're ready for the show, and I'll see you in the Discord chat. Link in the description below. Hi everyone, my name is Marietta, and I'm joining you all today from Vancouver, Canada. I work as staff software engineer at Uplight. In my free time, I contribute to open source projects. I'm one of the Python core developers, a PSF fellow member, and one of the co-organizers of Vancouver Pyrenees. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub as Marietta. Documentation makes or breaks an open source project. When users want to use the open source library that you've made, the documentation is the first thing they'll read, not the code. Often when evaluating a third-party library, we look at the documentation first, and if it doesn't exist or it's not adequate, we probably don't want to use it. We, we will not bother looking at the code at all. So maintainers and contributors to open source projects need to care about documentation. In the Python world, documentation isn't written simply in a readme. The fact that Python documentation is available on a website in HTML format with links and things you can search for. It is what makes it useful for all of us. I really don't think I'll ever get very far in learning Python if this whole documentation was in a plain text readme file. And we're not writing all of this documentation with plain HTML either. Python documentation is built using a tool called Sphinx and a markup language called Restructured Text. So when talking about documentation in the Python community, you'll hear these two names um, together, Sphinx and Restructured Text. And you might wonder, what, what exactly are these two, two tools? I'll start with Restructured Text. Restructured text is a markup language. Um, you're probably familiar with other markup languages like Markdown or HTML. The file extension of restructured text is RST. This is the file where we will write the content of the documentation. Now, restructured text is actually not as lightweight as Markdown. It's a little bit more complicated and it is kind of unknown outside of the Python community. Markdown has been more widely adopted and not just by programmers. I know a lot of people who aren't programmers and they, they understand Markdown. Sphinx is the documentation generator. It is the engine that converts all of the RST files into HTML files. You will then host the HTML files generated by Sphinx. So readers would only be reading the output of the HTML files and not the restructured text. So now, hold on, wait a minute. Just now I said restructured text is more complicated than Markdown and is kind of obscure. So you might wonder now, like, why is Python using this? And I've talked to some Pythonistas, they've never even heard of restructured text. They haven't been contributing to Python projects, so they, they didn't need to know restructured text. I've also heard people telling me that the fact that restructured text is so obscure, it is a barrier 
to people wanting to contribute to Python. So one of their suggestions was that maybe we should start using Markdown for our documentation. The thing is, Python has been using restructured text since way back in 2002, before Markdown even existed. And you can read more about this on PEP 287, which is the proposal for adopting restructured text as Python doc string format. Nowadays, we, we write pretty much everything in restructured text. Official Python documentation is in restructured text. Python enhancements proposals, the PEPs, are written in restructured text. So if you ever have a big great idea for Python, you need to write the PEP for it one day. You need to know how to write, write it in restructured text. And it's not just CPython that uses this. Many other Python projects, Pylint, Request, Black, AIO HTTP, Python Packaging, Flask, all of those projects, their documentation are written in restructured text. So if you ever want to contribute to any of those, you will need to write documentation in restructured text. This is an important and useful skill to have as an open source contributor. Markdown is not bad. It is indeed much simpler and easier to adopt. But having written documentation in both Markdown and Restructured Text, I just don't find Markdown sufficient. It, it lacks certain features. And I think you shouldn't feel intimidated by Restructured Text. Yes, a little, it is a little bit more complicated, but it's not hard. You can learn it. And I want to help lower this barrier by introducing you to some of the features of Restructured Text and Sphinx. Let's start with something easy. Um, so here is the comparison of how you'd write section headers. On the left is how you do it in Restructured Text, and on the right, is markdown. So notice that in restructured text, instead of the pound sign, um, you'd add underlines. Now, if I, something to think about, if I simply to present you the text to you without telling you whether these are markdown or restructured text, which one looks more obvious to you that these are section headers? Personally, I found the underlines to be a clearer signal that these are the titles, these are the section headers. The pound sign, if I didn't know that this was a markdown file, I would think that those are code comments, not headers. Next, let's learn how to write hyperlinks. In markdown, this is how you do it. You wrap the text that you want to convert to links in square brackets and the URL itself in parentheses. In the restructured text, the, the, the syntax looks somewhat different. Um, you, you, wrap the whole, uh, you write the URL in triangular braces, and then you wrap the whole thing in backtakes, and then there's a, this little underscore. So one of the useful feature with restructured text is that you can name and label your links allowing for reusability. So if you found yourself referencing the same URLs multiple times in one document, you don't have to write the same links multiple times. You can declare one name for it like a variable, like a like a variable at the bottom of your documentation by typing out the dot dot and underscore and the name of the URL, the label, followed with the actual URL. And then later in the documentation, you can refer to it by wrapping the name of the link um, with backticks and the underscore after. You can add images by using the image directive. So dot dot space image and the two columns and then pass to the image. Now pay attention to the space and indentation. Um, especially in, in the image directive, there is a space between the two dots 
and the word image. And I noticed the um, new contributors writing restructured t- text the first time, they, they missed that, they missed the space and didn't realize the image didn't render. So space, sp- white space and indentation in restructured text are important, just like, just like in Python code. If you're writing technical documentation, so of course your documentation will contain code samples. In restructured text, it's just a matter of adding the two columns. Two columns, a blank space, a blank line, and after that, indent your code. And then that whole thing will be rendered as as a code block. Again, pay attention to the to the white space, there needs to be an, an empty line between the two columns and the code sample and the code block and indent, you need to indent it. Indentation and white space are important. Tables are not part of the core definition of markdown. You would need to find an extension or a special markdown renderer that can generate tables for you. But tables are supported natively out of the box in restructured text. Same thing as the table of contents. So if your documentation is long, it has lots of different headings, a table of content would be really useful to the readers. And this is real easy to do. Um, Automatically, you just add the contents directive at the top of your documentation and the table of content will be generated automatically by Sphinx. Um, Sphinx is not dated. This is part of the feature of restructured text. Sorry about that. Um, One of the features that I appreciate the most is the ability to do cross-referencing, being able to provide links from one page to another page. And this is accomplished by two elements, and you need both restructured text and Sphinx to do this whole thing. So first, you need to declare a target. Uh, It's like a bookmark, so notice that the syntax here might look familiar to you. This, This looks just like how we would name our links a few slides earlier. Now, in the other page, Say in the, for example, if the in in the index, I wanna, I wanna direct my readers to the installation guide to that specific section of the documentation. I can do that simply by adding the ref row and the name of the target. When the index is generated in HTML, it will have a link pointing to the installation documentation to that specific section. So you don't need to even know what is the file name of the installation. Like you don't need to hard code that path at all. You just need to know the name of the target and Sphinx will build this whole thing for you. That's the the referral. So how do we get started with this whole thing? First, you need to install Sphinx pip install it, pip install Sphinx, and I do recommend installing it in a virtual environment. Then, in your project, you should have a dedicated directory for your documentation. Don't mix it up with your source code. Have Create a docs directory. You can name it something else, but usually I've seen projects use just docs. Um, once you have the docs directory, in there you can call the, you can run the Sphinx quick start command. What Sphinx Quick Start does is automatically creating several files that are necessary for Sphinx to build the documentation. Once you run the Sphinx Quick Start command, you should see some um, some directories got generated, the build directory, static, and t- templates. You should also see the index rst file automatically created. And then you can start writing your documentation there. When you're ready to build your docs and to generate the HTML out of your docs, just type make HTML on the terminal. All the HTML will then be generated under the build slash HTML directory. Now you can open the index file with your favorite browser. 
And if you find it tedious having to rebuild the documentation each time you make code changes, you can install a third-party extension called Sphinx AutoBuild. This is not part of Sphinx itself, it's a third-party, so you would need to install it, pip install Sphinx AutoBuild. And then this tool can detect changes in your documentation and automatically rebuild and refresh the browser for you. Other useful extensions you may want to check out are the Autodoc and the InterSphinx extensions. With Autodoc, you can automatically generate documentation out of the doc strings in your code base. With InterSphinx, you can reference not just documentation within your own project, you can reference other projects' documentation. Now, restructured text and Sphinx are really not complicated. You can definitely learn this, and there are various documentation and tutorials out there. I do hope that you feel inspired, you feel less intimidated by this, you want to learn it, and then with this new skill, I know that you will be able to start contributing to open source projects, and you get to write your documentation better. So, thank you so much for listening to my talk. You can follow me on Twitter as Marietta. And if you do, if you appreciate my talks and my open source contributions, one of the ways you can support me is by becoming my sponsor on GitHub. Thank you so much.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Maya Ayubi, and today I'll be talking to you about something we've all been watching very closely, the COVID-19 vaccination rollouts. Some questions I really wanted to answer were, what countries use which vaccine types? What are the top countries vaccinating? And when will I get my vaccine? So let's get started. Here are some imports. We'll talk about these later, but the main ones we'll be working with is Pandas, Plotly, and Facebook Profit. The data that I have here is collected from Kaggle and GitHub and use Pandas read CSV to read in the data. The exploration, it's good. It's a good practice to look through your data before you start working with it. Pandas makes this easy to do. Some cleanup I had to do, for example, is assigning missing ISO codes for countries like Wales and Scotland and Ireland. But let's talk about something that I've had on my mind. mRNA versus non-mRNA vaccinations. So the country data set is a really great data set with different types of vaccines, vaccine information. I was interested in the different deployments of the vaccine, and there are some new types of vaccines never used before called mRNA that are used in parts of the world to vaccinate against COVID now. So we used Plotly's Cora plot to look at what countries are using which types of vaccines. Some interesting geopolitics here is that you notice that the global south is mostly using non-mRNA, whereas the global north is using predominantly mRNA. Of course, there are some global northern countries that are using both. So vaccine types aside, which of these countries are vaccinating the most? Well, Let's, let's see. So here we're gonna use a bar plot to plot the top 10 countries that have the highest number of vaccinations per 100 filtering on populations that are greater than 10 million. And we see that Great Britain is in the lead, but they have less than 30% of people vaccinated at the moment. And the U.S. comes in second place, and Chile, surprisingly, in third, while everyone else, such as Turkey, Poland, and Romania, all the way up to Spain, have less than 10% people of people vaccinated. Well, here are the leaders, so how are they doing over time? And we see that, yeah, these countries overall are doing are vaccinating more and more. And it's really interesting to see how the trend or the rate of vaccination is for all these individual countries. But the one that I'm most interested in is the United States. And there's a lot you can do with this global data, but since I live in America, I want to look at what states are vaccinating the most. So let's see what's going on. Here we use Plotly's Choropleth map again, but this time we're looking at it just on a scope of the United States rather than, the, rather than globally. And it's cool to see that Alaska is vaccinating the most out of any other state. And I wonder if that's probably because it's so cold they don't need to keep their vaccines in freezers. <laughs> Jokes aside, but yeah, smaller, smaller states seem to be doing really well, which is strange because you would think that states with cities where people are highly packed and there's high density, you'd be able to distribute the vaccines to them faster. Well, but what's the overall trend in the nation? So U.S. total vaccinations, we see that clearly there's a number of vaccines, that the number of vaccines vaccinations are going up steadily, but the curve upwards suggests that it is accelerating. But is it enough to reach our national goal? Well, which goal is that? So on January 25th, 
President Joe Biden pledged 150 million vaccinations, meaning shots in arms, in 100 days. This got me really excited, and I wanted to see how soon I would possibly get vaccinated since I'm not in the early phase. So I found an open source forecasting package called Profit from Facebook. And Profit has two modes of prediction, linear and logistic. Logistic mode is for when you have a known cap in your system. And for us, our known cap is the population of the United States. In this case, around roughly 328 million. So, okay, since Profit can give us a prediction, what does Profit say about US vaccinations? Well, it looks like by April 30th, we'll have 248 million vaccinations. That's great news. And it looks like Joe Biden's prediction might be a little conservative. And it's according to Profit, it looks like we'll be making more than 100 million vaccinations in 100 days. Well, Profit's doc says it handles weekly seasonality, missing data, and outliers really well. So I figured I'd try it out, and I'm pretty hopeful with, and I'm pretty happy with what I'm getting. And I feel good knowing that there is hope after all. And if you want to play around with this data or notebook, it's available on my GitHub. And if you have any suggestions on other analyses you'd like me to include in this notebook, I can be reached through email. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening to my talk, and I hope to see you all in person very, very soon.
welcome to Fast API Fastly, a quick introduction to a nifty project. I'm Mark Rice. I'm a senior software engineer at Gardent Health, and I'm really excited to talk to you about Fast API. Some of the goals are I want to introduce you all to myself and then to Fast API. Uh, I'm going to tell you why I love it. I'm going to show you why I love it. Uh, tell you how I've used it and just generally kind of fa uh, hype fast API up. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, this is me. I'm Mark Rice. Uh, I'm a dad of two. Got a couple of dogs and you know just kind of have a whole mess of people in and out of my house uh, with a lot of love. And uh, I'm a D&D player because dads have to have hobbies. I really just have like one hobby. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a bioinformatics software engineer at Garden Health. Uh, probably mostly a software engineer and less of a bioinformatics person, but uh, it means that I get to sit right at the inflection point between science and technology, and it's really fun. Uh, I'm a proud Pythonista and a co-organizer of Pinensula, and I'm really excited you guys are watching today. So, a little bit about Fast API. Um, it's a lightweight Python web framework uh, with just the right amount of batteries included. I mean, to me, it's like the Goldilocks choice of web frameworks. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. Uh, Flask is great, but like you gotta go buy a weird battery that you probably don't have. Uh, it definitely wasn't included. And uh, you know, it's really amazing for what it does when you need something fast and simple. And then there's tools like Django, which has like amazing batteries included, but it's like literally the whole box of batteries. Um, so I think Fast API comes with just enough to make some great web tools, uh, in particular, as the name implies, APIs, with low effort and high rates of return. Um, it's built on top of some really great projects like Starlet and Pydantic. Uh, the Pydantic is for data validation, so when you make a request, uh, it needs to be able to uh, be serialized into a Pydantic uh, object. And that's really cool for someone like me who wasn't very uh, well versed in the web world, but like I know objects and it was very exciting for me. And so the, web, the framework is relatively new. It was announced in 2019, uh, but for something that has been only out for two years it is it is feature rich uh you know it does what i need it to do there's examples of it it's got great documentation it's just all around a good project um i'll show you the site later and in the chat i will make sure that uh, i put the documentation there but also if you google fast api the docs will come up So a little bit about why I love it. I mean, I've obviously kind of been hyping it up for a few minutes here, uh, but it's simple and I'm kind of a simple man. I'm not too smart. Um, it's fast as heck. It works when I need it to do. It's snappy, uh, you know, as long as your code is snappy. Uh, it comes with free docs. It's really cool. I'm gonna show you that because for me, this was 50% of the selling point, which is maybe a bit, you know, of hyperbole. Uh, but did I mention it's easy? So let me show you. I'm going to show you just like a quick example of what a fast API, like what it takes to get Hello World going. It's five lines, five lines of code. Import the fast API class, instantiate the class. Tell the class what your default is and tell it what you're going to return. So that's simple. 
and it's built in with asynchronous uh, support. And we run it using Uvicorn. And let's take a peek at it. So we'll fire up the Uvicorn server. Everything's going, it's happy. The startup is complete. And let's take a peek. I had this loaded. Uh, so let's refresh it. And look at that. Hi, Pineinsula. So great. We have an API endpoint. It's up. It's running. Five lines of code. Five seconds of effort. What do we get with that five seconds of effort? Well, if we go to the docs, which you saw I did not create this endpoint comes free swagger docs uh, it also has redoc available to you as well I believe it's under the redoc it is under the redoc and you get this awesome fully fleshed out uh, it's built on open api so this uh, schema is generated and it sort of tells everything and that's why we're able to easily use swagger docs um, it also means that your docs are easy to customize in line in code. You don't have to have a separate docs file. It's really cool. Uh, so let's take a look, right? We have uh, our root. It's a git. It doesn't take parameters. Uh, we expect a 200 successful response. It's going to send JSON back as the media type. And oh, well, let's take a, let's take a peek because it gives us a free try it out button. So we don't have parameters. Let's just go ahead and execute it and see what happens. Look at that. It tells me what the curl is going to look like, where it's going, and what happened. I got a 200 back. There's my message. That's awesome. So let's go back and look at another example that uses a little bit of the pedantic data validation things and will show us uh, something that we can play with a little bit more. So let's take a look at example two. So in this example, I'm using the Pydantic base model to create a new class called container. Uh, it's representing like a Docker container. Uh, it has a name, where the container's stored, the command you want the container to run, and maybe some optional arguments, right? So, Let's see, we are going to create this new application running. We have a endpoint that you would post to in the slash container that is called create container and it will take a JSON body uh, that needs to match the container class. And then it'll just spit the container back out. Um, in the next slide, I'll kind of explain what uh, I've used it for. And this is sort of like a very simple, like boiled down version of what I've actually used this for in production at Garden Health. So let's take a peek at this running. So we're just going to tell Uvicorn to go to our second example app, reload. Everything fires up. It's happy. Let's reload this. You'll see we get our new example in container. So let's, what do we have in here? We have create container. So container is expecting. So because we gave, we're using this, uh, these tools that come built in with Fast API, it already knows the schema. It can give me some example values. So when I say I want to try it out, then I can uh, I can do that. So let's let's open the science. Uh, <laughs> let's open the science Docker container that is here, and you know, give it a command. Docker run. Ah, well, Docker run's already going to happen. Uh, you know, we'll say Python in the science module. 
everything. Sorry, this is going to get me. Everything. And the args are going to be stuff. Let's execute it and see what we get. So we get a 200. This is what we got from the body. Here's the header. And that's expected. So what happens if you give it bad data? So let's forget to put location in. And let's execute that. What do we get? 422, oh no. That's a validation error. So clearly we are missing a value. A field was required. Well, what field was it? Location, okay. It's missing a value. So let's do that. Let's put it back, right? What happens if we just pass it an empty string? Oh, that's okay because the location is empty. Can you pass it a none? Darn. You can you cannot pass it a none. Well, that's okay. Uh, let me execute it back, give it a proper thing and we're happy go lucky. So this is just a quick example. It's nothing too fancy. Obviously this doesn't do much. Uh, we can reset the, uh, the connection there. And look at this. You can see my failures, right? Good logging in Uvicorn. So let's go ahead and close that. So it's just a little example, but I mean, even this, right, with like data validation on something that's posting into your web application. This is, you know, less than 15 lines of code, uh, which is exciting to me because again, as I said earlier, I'm not exactly the world's smartest person. So that's why I love it. And uh, what I've used it for uh, at Garden Health, uh, we're a liquid biopsy company. We test cell-free DNA for the presence of uh, tumor DNA. We run a bunch of bioinformatics against it to screen for cancer. And in a lot of cases, we were also able to help pharma companies find participants uh, for their studies and perform like BI analysis on those studies to kind of create a report on whether or not somebody is or isn't eligible or whatever the study kind of wants them to know. And uh, what that meant for me was I needed kind of a controller to direct like these incoming requests from our, uh, our limbs system, which is our laboratory uh, inventory management system. And uh, we needed to direct those requests out to uh, Docker containers that run uh, study specific information on it. Uh, so I needed to take a request, validate its parameters, and then kick off a container using kind of the provided information about the study. Um, so some important things that uh, I had to look out for are it, you know, we're an FDA regulated company and everything needs to be documented. Everything needs to be easy to ingest for regulatory teams to make sure that we're meeting our burden of documentation and proof, you know, uh, so that one of the things that excited me, uh, and kind of got me interested in fast API was the built-in documentation and the docs that get auto-generated with no work from me uh, because I have to over-document everything. Any free documentation is great documentation. So another thing, it needed to be testable. Uh, again, we're regulated. 
but so that meant that it needed to be testable yes with tests but also by maybe non-technical individuals so again swagger docs having the try it out option and letting someone be able to test a live instance of my web application see the response see the messaging really be able to understand what's going on take screenshots take videos allow us to build our burden of documentation uh, and again it really just needed to be easy because like I'm a simple guy, uh, and I had never really needed to do much with web apps other than single, you know, like simple proof of concepts. Uh, my kind of like historical skill set had been in developing algorithms uh, that were running on high performance computing systems and building system integration suites. So naturally, my first major project at uh, Garden was build this web. API endpoint to take requests from this very big complicated third-party system and run our very complicated bioinformatics pipeline and it has to like basically be one level below full CDX compliance. So it was a big ask and in my opinion fast API really made it work with almost no effort fast api fastly again this was just a quick overview but i wanted to show it to you and i hope you enjoyed it
Hi, uh, my name is Moshe Zadka, and today I'm going to talk to you about mocking patterns, um, how to use mocks in Python really well. Um, mocks are used in tests. Um, to illustrate testing, we need to have something to test. Um, and the something we're going to test right now is this little caricature of a network function. Um, think about it as a, you know, maybe a caricature of an HTTP downloader, right? Because it has all the right bits, but it's very, very minimal so that I can um, focus on the test. So this is a copy chunk. It takes a socket-like object and a file-like object, and it reads from the socket. It checks that the chunk is correctly formatted, and then it writes the chunk to the file-like object. And if it's not, it raises a value. Um, again, you know, very simplistic, but it does have all the parts of something that um, that that we, we will want to test, including the fact that it expects a socket object and a file object that we are often things that you will want to avoid because creating a socket with the right option and creating a file like object with the right option is sometimes annoying and unnecessary and it's much more reliable to just do it or everything in memory. So this is a classic example of like, why would you want to mock? Um, so here's how a test might look like. And because I'm not using like a real testing framework, because I did not want to go through the trouble of integrating a real testing like framework, um, I wrote like a little bit of a minimal, minimal test harness, just runs the function and uh, um, shows you what exception it got. Uh, so this just, you know, is like a, uh, a little bit of a unit test framework that just will help us uh, work. And this is like the typical structure of um, of a test, right? Like you you kind of create the stuff that you need and then you copy the chunk from a socket to the file object. And as we expected, we got a value here, magic mock name, mock.reserve and ID. And you notice that we had two mock objects, so the only way we can guess it's a right exception is that we see reserve and we can guess that it's something related to the socket. Um, it would be nice if you could make sure that it's actually the socket, right? And again, imagine in a real test you might have many mock objects and that's going to be very hard to kind of make an informed guess. Um, so the first pattern I want to show you is naming your mocks. And that's something that's very easy to do very diligently. And um, let's see how it changes the, um, the, the output. So now we can see that it's the socket reserve, right? And we know that it actually got the reserve and did not like that. So this is already much easier to debug. And again, remember that tests by definition will run on like the buggiest version of your code because they will find the problems and you will fix them before you, you know, before you even check in sometimes, right? You, you will run the unit test. So um, they run on very, very, very bad versions of your code. It's good if the um, output from problems like exception is more readable here, you can see socket, right? And if I had multiple sockets, I would maybe name them differently and it's much easier to, to debug the exception here. So that's the, that's the first lesson, naming. Uh, now, the other thing is that you notice that um, um, I have two arguments here and I could easily make the bug of, you know, in the test or, you know, perhaps if it's a function calling a function, I could do it some place along the call stack to make them. And, and here, of course, we got, we could see that this is, doesn't make sense. So we would fix it. But um, the problem is that it still got all the way to the uh, checking uh, because mocks have every method. Um, so one way to avoid mocks having every method uh, is to spec them. So I know that socket is supposed to look like a socket. So I want to tell mock, make it look like a socket. I know that file object is supposed to look like a file. So I'm going to tell uh, um, mock, make it look like a file. And this means that they won't have every single attribute. They only have the attributes they need to emulate whatever spec you give them. And that means if I, again, make the mistake of uh, inverting the arguments, now I get a very clear mock object has no attribute reserve. It doesn't get the value error, right? In this code, it will fail right in this line. So that's great, right? Failing early when there's a bug is much, much clearer. And again, you know, in real life, that's a bug that you know you can easily do and will give you much better feedback in your CI or your local test runner or whatever it is. 
So um, this is a second lesson spec. In real life, I'll notice that you know, even though here I named one in one and spec in the other, in real life I would combine them. I would do the spec and the name here for pedagogical reasons. I want to separate to show the uh, uh, advantages separately. But um, if you take nothing else away from this talk, I would take the lesson, always name and spec your mocks. If you can, like enforce it via a linting rule or something, because these tests are not much harder to write. Look, I, you know, had to add this and this. This was not a lot of code, but it gives you much higher quality um, errors. Um, so now let's uh, write like a slightly more interesting thing. And like, let's actually like make sure that we reserve um, has a return value, right? Um, because that's very useful, right? We actually will want to have a return value. And then we'll get the proper value error. Uh, be hooray because it um, um, be, be, because it is not compatible with the protocol, right? Remember the protocol was supposed to start with a greater than sign. Well, so now now that we know how to actually make sure that um, our function um, actually get, you know works, right? Uh, we we do want to kind of eventually get um, to the last. Um, the last, uh, the, the, the last line in copy chunk, right? We actually want to move past the value error. Well, we know exactly what to do for that, right? We um, just, okay, I, I guess before that, um, uh, let's, uh, let, let's make sure that we emulate uh, a broken socket, right? That's very important, right? Like a socket can raise an exception. We want to make sure that we know what the function does in this case. Um, so we do that with side effect. Um, and as you can see, this, you know, because we don't have any kind of recovery, right? In, maybe that's good that we don't have recovery. In that case, the test would verify that you're raising the actual exception. If you want to have some recovery, some retry or something like that, you would actually verify that the retry worked. Okay, so now we want to actually succeed. Um, so um, okay, we want to make it B, sorry. Um, and, and so now we want to make sure that when we do that, we actually managed to uh, write the uh, to to call the um, the file object write method. So let's check. And oh, I didn't work. Huh. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. Let's uh, try to debug that. Um, so what is be all right yep so we need of zero here and that's a bug in the code that we cut uh, because we were very very careful to write a good unit test so now let's um fix the code remove that and now uh we know we we saw that it's actually called right we got this uh value error uh with the call count being one so we know that um, it actually called the function. Now that's good that we know that we, we can make sure that we actually got there, uh, but we probably want to know that it actually called it with the right value. Um, so we can also get the call arguments here, um, get it and, and put it in chunk and then see what the chunk is. And we see that it actually got the right chunk. Um, and we can, you know, do other stuff. So, um, Um, we we probably would also want to uh, verify that um, we actually called reserve on the chunk um, with the right argument. So we can say um, a dot socket dot reserve dot call args, and then we do something like size quarks. Then we raise the value error. Um, and this didn't work, so let's do that. Okay, chunk. Yep, so it was the right chunk. And um, when we did that, we um, uh, we called it with the right size. Um, so basically, this is um, you know, if I have, if I you know, wanted you to remember, um, like you know, kind of three important um, things 
from this talk. I would say their uh, name, umox, spec umox, use um, return value. Um, to, to check regular conditions, use a side effect uh, to check um, various um, corner cases and use cold. Uh, and if you want to kind of verify that you got like the actual argument you expect, um, call args um, to actually um, check that uh, you, your functions were called and your methods were called with the right arguments. Um, so that's it. That Those are like um, five things that I see a lot of people don't do enough when they do mocks. Um, so I would encourage you uh, to do these things um, a lot more when you uh, when you use mocks in Python um, because they don't take much more effort and they will make your tests uh, a lot better. Um, so that's it. That's like the um, few mocking patterns that I want to show you today. Um, thank you all for listening, and I will be on the Discord uh, to answer any more questions you might have.
Well, there you have it, folks. Another four great talks from four great speakers. If you want to be like them, just get in touch with me, Moshe, or Mark, and we'll make it happen. As yet another successful Peninsula draws to a close, I just want to draw special attention to the fact that this is celebrating four years of Peninsulas. 28 divided by 4, that's a lot of Peninsulas per year, and we've managed to keep the lights on, even through uh, thick and thin. And so to celebrate that, I'll make good on a promise here. Uh, that I promised in the intro here. So uh, sing along if you know the words. Happy birthday, Peninsula, and, uh, you know, a very happy 2021 to all of you. Uh, basically, the only thought I'll leave you with now is start thinking about venues, because we'll be seeing each other in person pretty soon. Bye for now.